Good evening everyone and thank you for being there. Tonight's podcast brings together a number of different thoughts. Initially I thought about offering some tips for working effectively with the published transcripts of the Herald's visitations from the Tudor England. I thought I'd give a few words about William Dugdale as an introduction, but as I assembled some notes, it was clear to me that I wanted to talk more about Dugdale than the transcripts, and here I do have to admit to an element of hero worship. Of course it would be unfair to speak about Dugdale without mentioning the other pioneers and innovators from the early history of modern genealogy. So here we are, a discussion about the early genealogists with special reference to William Dugdale and a few tips at the end about how to get the most from their work. A very different podcast from the one I started out on. Welcome to Family Trees Talk, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. In 1530, King Henry VIII regularised an old practice of sending heralds from the College of Arms to different parts of the country, requiring those men who claimed a right to bear arms to register their pedigrees with them. These surveys were called the Herald's Visitations. Records were kept in the College of Arms, and from Victorian times, the Harleian Society edited and published their transcripts. They remain a valuable source for anybody researching their family history prior to parish registers. It seems that genealogy is as old as man himself, or at least as old as storytelling. But when we consider modern genealogy, we must respect William Dugdale as one of the fathers of the profession. Dugdale was born two months before the gunpowder plot, and died two years before the Glorious Revolution. So he is not an exact contemporary of Pepys, but the London that Dugdale knew was Pepys's London, and those years give us an important context. William Dugdale was working when the profession was cleaning itself of the reputation for sloppiness and corruption which had cloaked it during the Tudor and especially Elizabethan times. Dugdale may be the most important genealogist of that, if not subsequent centuries. I certainly think he is. But he does not stand alone. He was part of a renewed movement of scholarship that wasn't restricted to family history, nor even local history. Instead, we must see him as working in an age that saw the birth of the Society of Antiquities, the establishment of the Bodleian Library, with historic manuscripts from the start, and eventually the Royal Society. Modern genealogy grew out of this parochial renaissance. Dugdale's story is not without its romance. Romance, if nothing else, his wife was hardly 17 when he married her, and she bore him 19 children. He was educated, and probably would have called himself a gentleman. He acquired a manor in Warwickshire. But he was by no means from the wealthy upper crust, and it was during a dispute over land boundaries and enclosures that he found himself presenting evidence from estate documents and old traditions. Perhaps even at that stage he realised that one was more powerful than the other, we don't know. But it was during this adjudication that he met William Burton, one of the brazenose antiquarians of those years. His history of Leicestershire had only recently been published. With Burton's encouragement, and with the assistance of Sir Simon Archer, Dugdale commenced on his History and Antiquities of Warwickshire, the main work for which he is remembered. His research took him to London, and brought him into contact with those figures who would, years later, eventually recommend his appointment as a herald. It is ironic that one of his supporters was Edward Deering, a colourful character who had been born in the Tower of London where his father held office. Deering is probably best remembered for giving us the first written evidence of somebody purchasing Shakespeare's first folio. He was also an active antiquarian, and when the ups and downs of his very turbulent political career allowed, 
He assembled an impressive library, which included a rolls of arms from the 13th century, which now bears his name in the British Library. But these were the days when a man like Deering, who could purchase his appointment as a lieutenant of Dover Castle, saw no conflict between treasuring antiquities and constructing a completely false pedigree for himself. And this illustrates the dubious standards of genealogy at this time. Much of the blame for the false pedigrees has been laid at the door of the early heralds, though I hope to put forward that much of that criticism is unbalanced. The heralds had delivered long-standing services to the crown before they specialised in genealogy, and it was in the reign of Edward II that the need to verify claims to rare arms was given some prominence. This developed, eventually, in the practice of visitations, where the heralds would spend time in a region recording and examining the different claims. Initially, this was done by visiting families in their homes. Later, any claimants were called to a local recording place, often a tavern, but the need for due deference took its place. No knight was expected to travel more than six miles to be heard, and they also expected to be entertained by the herald during the process. Now, while these examinations did involve some need for family history, we can see that it wasn't as detailed as we might expect today. The most cursory glance at the published transcript of the visitations show that they saw little need to include dates in a pedigree. Descent through the line was sufficient to establish a coat of arms, and initially this might have been an acceptable level of inquiry. The heralds were incorporated into the College of Arms in 1484, and King Henry modernised the visitation procedures in 1530. In 1528, the college established its library, although its holdings go back before that date. However, it's wrong to think that worthy genealogy hadn't gone on before these years. A hundred years previously, William Worcester had produced an important book on the ancient families of Norfolk, unfortunately a book now lost. And John Rouse had produced an important role on the Earls of Warwick, dated round about 1480 and now in the College of Arms. But for all this, it seemed to be that the local historians had the march on the genealogist as far as scholarship was concerned. And this was evidenced most strikingly in 1576 with the publications of William Lombard's Perambulations of Kent, a book that set the benchmark for future local histories. But it was the Elizabethan years that were a sorry time for the genealogist, as new wealth meant that new families were expecting pedigrees to be found for them. Hmm. So, is the criticism of Tudor Heralds fair? Well, their work remains valuable for the modern genealogist, four or five hundred years after it was compiled, and even though we are using those transcripts today for a purpose that they were never intended for. And remember, they are more often found to be correct. And the instances of actual invention are really quite rare. Many of the family trees produced are no more than three or four generations. Evidence of a household talking about grandparents and grandchildren along with some uncertain mention of a previous ancestor, perhaps. We simply mustn't consider them as we would consider civil registration or census. But without doubt, the genealogist had to raise his game, and that's where William Dugdale came in. You're listening to Family Trees Talk with Malcolm Noble. My thanks to Freeze Effects for the royalty-free music, I'd like to draw your attention to the show notes which I've posted on the website for tonight's podcast. They include more detailed references to the works that I've mentioned, as well as a clutter of web links that you might like to explore. 
talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. Later on in this podcast, I'll be sharing with you one or two tips that I found helpful when working with the transcripts themselves. And tonight, we're talking about the early genealogists, and especially William Dugdale. When, in 1635, Dugdale came to London, one of his new acquaintances was Sir Henry Spellman, by now an old man. It was Spellman who recommended in 1638 that Dugdale should be brought into the college as a herald. This living gave Dugdale the opportunity to continue his researches, but within a few years England would be at civil war. An unhappy time for Dugdale. He saw the Battle of Edge Hill in his home county and undertook different roles for the king during the refuge at Oxford. Oxford, of course, enabled him to make good use of the Bodleian, and he certainly did. It was in Oxford that he met Elias Ashmole, he of the later museum, whom Dugdale would know as a fellow herald, and eventually as a son-in-law he would marry one of Dugdale's younger daughters. In 1648, Dugdale spent some time in France, where he met the French antiquarian Le Roc, whose history of the French Harcourt family will be published only shortly afterwards. The study of genealogy in France was, of course, far more advanced than it was in England. Dugdale must have recognised this. In 1655, his work on the English monasteries was published, followed a year later by his Antiquities of Warwickshire. He published several other titles, perhaps the next most important is the English Baronage in 1675. In 1677 he was made Garter King at the College of Arms, but only after Ashmole had first refused it. So what was Dugdale's contribution to the discipline of genealogy, rather than the evident value of the books he published? We're told of his skill at assembling the evidence and drawing conclusions that the evidence presents. But I think his greatest gift to modern-day genealogists was two simple innovations. Firstly, that each step should, wherever possible, be evidenced by a contemporary source. Secondly, that source should be cited so that if people who come after him find it is an error, they can track the source to explain that error. Implicit in both of these innovations is the genealogist laying open their work for inspection. And so, these two simple steps, which seem hardly revolutionary to us, lifted genealogy to the status of a science, and this was in Stuart, England, remember. OK, now we come to the part of the podcast where I want to share with you some ideas about getting the most from these records. And as usual, I want to stress I'm not a professional, I'm not an expert. All I am is an amateur who has spent more than 40 years digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the self-taught lessons that I've learned. I've listed these tips under six different headings. And the first one is accessibility. You know, these books are not difficult to find. Many of them have been scanned and you can read them online. That would certainly be my first port of call. But try and stay away from the databases of the indexes. These don't really cut the mustard. <laughs> If they're not online, then go to your local county library. More than likely they will have a copy, and any family history society worth its salt will have a copy of the transcripts in their resource cupboard. Many are still in print, and you might be living in one of the lucky areas where their transcript is still available. So after you listen to this podcast, go to the Harleian website. The link is on my own website and see if there's a suitable copy available to you. You know, these books really are not expensive. But if your pedigree is in a Herald's transcript, then it is probably one of the earliest times that your family appeared in a published book. So I'm sure that you'll want a copy of the first edition for your family library. 
Okay, we've got hold of the book now. What do we do about it? And I can hear the whiz kids saying, well, you go to the index and you look down your list of surnames and you flick to the relevant page. But isn't this the podcast for the genealogists with too much time on our hands? So let's take a bit of a more considered approach. The first thing we want to notice is who were the heralds who were making the visitation. Very often the transcript is drawn from more than one visitation. Once we got hold of those names, find out what their reputation and custom were. Then you want to read the introduction or the preface. What we're trying to get hold of is some sort of feel of how heavily these transcripts have been edited. Now, it is always a sorry temptation to try and improve things, so I suppose we should forgive these editors. But if you've come across an editor who is more respectful of the documents, you are very close to reading the notes of a conversation between the Pedigree family and the Herald. And hey, wouldn't we want to listen to that? And the next thing we want to do is read the pedigree. Now, you might come across some abbreviations that are not so usual in family trees printed nowadays, but they're not too difficult, and and a, a bit of intelligent guesswork usually gets you there. But once again, I'm leaving a link on the webpage which uh, will take you to a very uh, extensive list of abbreviations. Now, the lack of dates can be irritating, and, and I share that frustration. Sometimes they give you regal years, that is to say the year number in the monarch's reign, and since we're only talking about three or four centuries, you'll soon get the hang of uh, interpreting that. And even so, it does give you very quickly a feel for the sort of era that we're talking about. Now, what the pedigrees are very good at is for identifying and isolating the different branches of the family. Once you get into a pedigree family, it can be quite easy to get muddled about which branch of the family we're talking about. And the transcripts are quite good at helping us with that. And hey, you know what? Always remember to look at the outer reaches of the pedigree. If the family was saying that a younger son of a previous generation married as somebody or other cockerel, but they can't quite remember her name. Hey, that says to me that auntie somebody or other cockerel wasn't in the inner circle of the family. So now we've got to the stage where we can get these pedigrees to really work for us. And what we're looking for is hints of further sources that may be able to help us. And I bet you end up looking at lawsuits and wills. Try and get a feel for the dates and the places and the people and then take those keywords and take them to the uh, National Archives, start on their uh, online catalogue, see what it throws up. But remember, the National Archives is only a starting point and use very broad keywords to start off with. What we're trying to do now is to get the pedigrees to unlock the local history for us. And it is that key to local history that can really start to pay dividends. Now, this is not a five-minute job, okay? This is going to take two or three years' work. For example, look at the surnames that were marrying into the pedigree family. Now, you're going to think that everybody sticks to their own class. Now, strictly speaking, that is not true. You will be surprised, and gradually you will build up a picture of the pecking order, either in the parish or in the cluster of parishes. And even if your name is not connected to the pedigree family, researching the genteel families is never wasted. If your ancestor lived on the land of or worked for a pedigree family, or maybe even both, the change in the circumstances for the toff often led to changes for the hoi bolloi. And again, turning to my own family history research, I can think of two or three examples where this has been so. So I hope I'm giving you a sense of how the transcript of the Herald's Visitations can take your family history research forward. Now there's a romantic in me, but at their rudest level, these books record a conversation between your ancestors 500 years ago and the Herald. Hey, we want to listen, don't we? Thank you for listening to Family Trees Talk. The podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands, with Malcolm Noble. That's it, I'm afraid my time's up for this month. Thanks to Freeze Effects for the royalty-free music, and Mr. Handel, of course, for writing it. And thanks to Emily Books for the voiceover. Most of all, thank you for being there. This has been the second in a new series of podcasts for The Family Historian. Can I just remind you that the show notes are available on talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. 
the future shows are stacking up nicely got lots of special guests in store it won't all be me chattering but it'll be posted the third day of each month at 9pm UK time I hope that you'll be there to catch me next month in the meantime good luck with your family tree hunting good night and God bless you